All right, fantastic. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another HRAI webinar. Today, we're doing Electrify Kelowna, a case study, and it is being presented by Jesse Scharf, Energy Supply Market Analyst, Analyst with Fortis BC, and John Drazik, Regional Energy Solutions Manager with Fortis BC. We got, a, we got a pretty packed presentation coming up. And if you'd like to ask questions during it, please feel free in the question and answer bar at the bottom of your screen or the chat room, and we'll try to get at them. If you don't get at them in the moment, uh, we will do so at the end of the presentation. Without further ado, uh, Jesse and John, why don't you join us on camera here? There he is. Oh, and um, muted. Muted, Jesse. Yeah, just straight awesome. for John to take it away. John, let's see that face of yours. Yeah, no kidding. I hope you can hear me. We can hear you all right. Yeah. yeah um, and, I, and I did put on a really nice shirt even uh, working from home. Uh, but uh, yeah, it looks like uh, I'm having problems, unfortunately, with my video. No worries. It's the information. I apologize. That you, you know, it really is. I've been told <laughs> I really have a face for radio at any point. So probably saving your audience a little bit there. So we'll draw a picture. That technical difficulty. Yeah. We'll right. do an illustration of you and add it to in post. But uh, I will uh, take off my camera and give it to you guys. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. And to everybody on the line, thank you for taking time out of your day to join Jesse and myself today. We're going to explore some of the uh, some unique to BC our involve, uh, evolving energy landscape. And uh, we're also going to learn about a very interesting initiative, Kelowna Electrification Initiative, a study that Jesse will speak to in more details. A little bit about myself. I work on the energy solution side of our, our Fortis organization. So we work with builders and developers and customers looking to connect to our gas system. And a little bit about Fortis. Uh, if you don't know who we are, we're an integrated energy utility. We provide natural gas, renewable natural gas, electricity, and alternative energy sources to over 1.2 million customers across BC. That includes 135 communities and importantly, 58 First Nations and 150 traditional territories. Today, I'm coming to you from Vancouver Island, my home in Nanaimo, uh, home of the Coast Salish people on whose uh, traditional and unceded territory that I live, work, and play in. Uh, so just want to recognize that. So today, yeah, a little bit of a chat on, on some unique things happening in BC, but but not just, uh, while it's unique to BC, it's, I'm sure it's clear to everybody on the line that the climate's really a top priority right across Canada, and that no matter where you're coming from, uh, you recognize that we are literally in the midst of a transformative change in the energy that we use, where we're being challenged uh, to replace those traditional fuels, mostly fossil fuel based, and uh, move towards cleaner sources of energy. And, you know, we've depended on these really for a century uh, or more, you know, and so while for everyone on this line, for sure, this is going to be the first energy transition that we've seen in our lifetime. It's certainly not the first time the world has evolved and moved and transitioned from one source of energy to another source of energy. So this is where uh, my presentation looks at this, where and, it, and it's the look back over time where we we determined, you know, what was occurring with these previous ener energy traditions. And what we identified was that, you know, there wasn't always a clear winner out of the gate. There was a reason a transition occurred. And we identified that there had to be certain characteristics of whatever that new incumbent energy was that was our, the new the energy coming in that was displacing that incumbent energy. And with the next few slides that I'm going to speak about, uh, we're going to explore some of those key characteristics of energy that we feel must be addressed uh, before that there will be mass acceptance of that energy. Um, and why the use, uh, you know, we have to look and, and really consider these characteristics when we consider fuel sources moving forward. So in order for an energy farm to be successfully adopted and become dominant in the market, it must have a number of important characteristics that are interrelated. First of all, energy it's whatever energy we're moving to, it, it needs to be affordable for it to be adopted in mass. It needs to be cheap enough. That doesn't take too much person's income. People need to be able to afford it. Next, you have to consider that it needs to be abundant. There needs to be a sufficient supply of it that's there when you need it all the time. Any new energy form needs to be abundant for it to be adopted in mass. It also needs to be dense. 
And by energy density, uh, what I mean is, is that it needs to contain a lot of energy for its weight. You know, for example, wood, about 16 megajoules per kilogram. Uh, gasoline is about 45 megajoules per kilogram. Natural gas is 55. And you can see the trend here is we've moved and evolved. We've always increased that energy density, the less of it we need to perform a task. And uh, for example, just for contact uranium, about 3.9 million megajoules per kilogram. So again, the density, the energy uh, it needs to be there. It needs to be energy dense for it to be adopted in mass. Next, it also, we have to address its ability to be transportable. And what I mean by that is that that energy has to be able to get from where it's generated to where it's needed. Just being energy dense al as alone doesn't help with that. If you can't get it to where it's needed, it won't be adopted on mass. And lastly, uh, there was, so those have been the four characteristics throughout time. But in the transition that we're in today, we have to add this fifth element and that's clean. Energy has to be clean. It has to have lower emissions. That's certainly on the table with any energy that we look to move towards. And this is also where things get challenging uh, because clean energy, it's not always energy dense. It's not always affordable. It's not always abundant and it's not always transportable. Uh, but this also creates opportunity for, um, for us, you know, creates an opportunity for big opportunities. So, to take uh, to provide some context for this conversation, we need to understand, you know, the types of energy that we use today. So I'm going to speak about this from perspective of British Columbia. Um, so to, really to understand the scale of the transformation required. So currently we're using about four types of energy right now uh, to power our homes or businesses, transportation and industry, what we call like an energy mix in BC. So Jess, you can advance the slide there. So in British Columbia, a lot of the energy provided in our province is through biomass or wood waste, mostly used in industrial applications. Next, we have natural gas. And we also use a lot of liquid fuels, diesel, gasoline. And lastly, of course, we have electricity. And here in BC, we're blessed. We have a significant resource of clean hydroelectricity. So at this point, I'll just pause and uh, I'm going to ask a question to to you, and I, I maybe the chat's a good place for you to put your answers, and we'll we'll see what we get. But uh, question for you is, is this: so considering those four types of energies that we're using in BC today, the biomass, natural gas, liquid petroleum fuels, and electricity, how much do you think our province, uh, you know, how much of that pie, energy pie is being powered by electricity? So. Maybe we can get a few, uh, you know, your anonymous here. So we you got can throw some 30 percent. Someone got a 30 sensor, 30 percent. Yeah. OK. All right, Philippe. Thank you. Any other gases out there? Come on, put your numbers in. 40 percent, says Sean. We got a 40, says Sean. Yeah. Does anyone want to go 41 and be closest to the actual value? Oh, we got a 50. Oh, yeah. 50. <laughs> All right. Well. If you had answered 17%, you'd have been correct. Here in BC, most of that is provided by the Provincial Crown Owned Utility, BC Hydro. They're about 14%. We're about Fortis BC, we're electric utility as well. We have a couple hundred thousand customers in the Southern interior. We make about 1% of that. And we have some other electric supply that's used as well. So 17% is powered by our, call it our clean energy source in BC. But what a, so understanding that, what you then have to look at and recognize is that there's 67% of this energy pie right now that's being used that is traditional fossil fuels. That's the refined petroleum, other gases, and the gas that Fortis BC is delivering in, its, in, in our transmission system, distribution system. So if we're going to think about transitioning to other fuels, and there's a lot of talk here in British Columbia about electricity being the answer. Uh, then you have to consider that we have to convert 67% of the energy we're using today by us to, uh, to a source that is currently only providing 17% of the energy that we're using today. So in other words, that electric system needs to provide five times the energy that it does today to replace the fossil fuel energy. So this is obviously a gargantuan task. 
And we need to ask ourselves if there's other alternatives and to consider again those five characteristics that need there need to be in place for a transition to be successful. So I'm going to touch on that that first one here on the next slide here. So Jesse, if you want to just advance it once here. So this graph is illustrating the amount of uh, energy that was delivered by the gas and the, elect uh, the electric systems during our uh, coldest day of the year in December, where the hydro, BC Hydro had recorded uh, record-breaking electricity demand, the highest ever recorded, and where BC Hydro was near its maximum capacity in terms of the quantity of, of energy that it can deliver, talking about the transportation aspect of it. At the same time, our 50, call it 50,000 kilometers of our natural gas infrastructure was able to ramp up and deliver twice that amount of energy. At the same time, we, would, we still had significant additional capacity remaining. So we have assets like uh, LNG storage, for example, uh, down in the lower mainland on Vancouver Island, and these act as bat great batteries for us to store in a liquid form that energy and be able to put it back into our system. Great characteristic of natural gas, it's compressible. You can't compress electrons in a transmission line, but you can compress gas molecules. And that's where our, even the LNG storage and our pipelines really become batteries. And they have this great ability to be able to store and deliver vast amounts of energy. And this speaks to uh, the need to consider that transportability of energy and how that it translates into a, you know, we're a province where our peak energy is in the middle of winter. It speaks to resilience and reliability. We need to have that energy when, when it's here. So um, I'll add just one last note on this slide in that, uh, you know, we've updated this slide. This was uh, 20, uh, 2022, uh, but in the previous year on the gas side, uh, our peak demand and our gas system between 2021 and 2022, when we last updated it, we increased our peak demand by 1200 megawatts in that one year. And just for consideration, if you're aware, we've got a pretty substantial hydroelectric project that's going on in Northern BC right now, Site C. At the end of the day, Site C will deliver about 1100 megawatts. So this is a great place to segue in my conversation about these key characteristics. We've touched on one of them. We're gonna jump back in. Uh, but it's a great time to, to introduce Jesse and uh, allow him to talk a little bit more detail about some of these aspects that I was speaking about with respect to that study we did on our Kelowna, uh, Kelowna uh, municipality where we provide electric service. So Jesse, over to you. Oh, and I said, uh, there's maybe a question up there. Yeah, it looks like you yeah. got one, John, if you wanna go first. Just a very quick question. So I think this was in reference to one of the graphs you had uh, percentage wise. Uh, I noticed the pie graph was from 2019. Has any of this changed in the past four years since the push for alternative heating methods like heat pumps? The question. Sure. I think the, uh, you know, we've certainly seen a lot of focus on adopting and transitioning, you know, new homes and existing homes to electric heat pumps. And um, there certainly has been uptake on it. And we anticipate that, that you know, that, that there is a role for all those electric appliances in, a, in an energy future as we, do, in, as we promote a real diversified approach to it. Um, I can't speak to the actual amounts. I would, I would suggest that uh, the, that they're more than likely very close to it. And Jesse, I don't know whether you can provide comment in terms of more specifically to, to the, uh, to those details and what they might look like today. I would guess that the numbers are pretty similar so far as well. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. So now I'll, I'll take everybody through um, the Electrify Kelowna case study. And really what this case study is, is looking into our electric system in the city of Kelowna, trying to understand what the impacts of, of fuel switching would be. Um, but I'll, I'll get into it a bit more detail, just give everyone a bit of context first. So this slide just shows some of the many studies that we've uh, been working on in the past to support the decarbonization of our natural gas delivery system. And this pathway study was maybe the first one out in 2020, uh, supported by Guidehouse, which as John alluded to, put forward our diversified pathway and clean growth pathway. And then there was also the UVIC and the UBCO studies. Um, and then some joint modeling conducted between the two major utilities in the, in the province of so BC, which I'll speak to a bit, and then the Electrify Kelowna case study, which is the focus of today. 
So just for some context first, um, by law, all publicly regulated utilities in BC, they must periodically file long-term resource plans. And the Utilities Commission Act referred to here uh, sets out the contents of those plans. And it, it must contain maybe three or four main things among other things, but that is the, the forecast of the annual energy consumption, then also the peak demand for our customers over the horizon of the plan, typically for 20 years and over various scenarios as well. But then after forecasting that demand, then it has to discuss the utilities plan to meet those load requirements into the future with, with their supply considerations and then a description of the facilities, the infrastructure that the public utility intends to construct. So in case for Fortis BC, we have both an electric and gas utility and our electric utility filed our long-term electric resource plan in the summer of 2021. That plan was accepted as being in the public interest by the BC Utilities Commission just in December last year. Whereas our gas utility, we filed our long-term gas resource plan in May of 2022. That plan is currently ongoing and still in the midst of review. But then also BC Hydro filed their electric integrated resource plan at the end of 2021, which is also still ongoing. And so this is kind of a unique opportunity in the province here. Um, it's probably the first time in a long time that all three utilities had their resource plans under review at the same or similar time. And I think the BCUC recognized that opportunity when they directed the two largest utilities, Fortis BC's gas utility and BC Hydro, to explore the scenarios containing each other's utilities resource plan. There was that joint scenario modeling I alluded to. And so what, what Fortis BC did is they analyzed the impact of some of BC Hydro's assumptions for their load scenarios and how those assumptions for BC Hydro's own scenarios would impact 40 species. BC Hydro did the opposite. So now those are both filed on the record of each utility's resource plan. It's kind of considered initial preliminary steps on joint planning between the utilities through looking at each other's load scenarios, but that's as far as it's gone at this point. And then just some context for the province. Um, so there's essentially two gas utilities in BC. Fortis BC and Pacific Northern Gas. I believe Fortis BC delivers about 97 or 98% of the gas in BC. And similarly, there are two electric utilities, BC Hydro and Fortis BC, the electric utility. As John mentioned earlier, there's approximately 1.2 million customers for the gas utility, Fortis, but about 180,000 customers for our electric utility. It's so roughly a six to one ratio. But where this case study starts to come in is that conveniently, Fortis BC is both a gas and electric supplier for the Kelowna area. So it kind of gives us a unique insight into the energy use of our customers in a fairly large urban area. Um, if you're not familiar with Kelowna, it's about four hours driving east of Vancouver in the southern interior of BC, close to about halfway between Vancouver and Calgary. The population is about 140,000, but grown pretty quickly. And FEI's gas customers will, will show on the next slide, as long as the electric customers in the province. Um, so on the slide, it shows a map of Kelowna and the major electric and gas lines used to supply customers in the city. With the gas shown in purple, um, with two gas pipelines serving the city, one from the north and one from the south. And then the um, electric transmission lines in red. So. For the electric side, all of the energy comes in from three 230 kilovolt transmission lines, two from the north and one from the south. And then having both these customers served within the city kind of gives it a nice ringed fence microcosm to study when it comes to energy delivery and consumption, because all of these facilities are owned, planned, and operated by Forest BC. But before, before I go any further, I just want to talk a bit about um, energy versus peak demand, just like explain this concept to anyone. So for either the gas or electric utility, energy is the amount of commodity, either the, it's the amount that's delivered over a period of time in megawatt hours or giga, gigajoules. And so in most cases, our forecasts, we consider the energy needs of our customers over a full year. Um, but when it comes to decarbonization, sometimes the discussion doesn't focus on as much on the peak demand and as well, the peak demand over various temperatures. And that's, that's what the case study shows. So the peak demand is the amount of electricity or gas that is consumed by our customers, either during the peak hour or the peak day, 
of the Portis BC, the coldest winter day, since we're a, a northern uh, winter, winter peaking utility and it's measured in megawatts. So in, on the electric side, by law, uh, we have to ensure that we have sufficient infrastructure in place to meet the forecast peak demand in any given year. So the energy is the power used over time, whereas the peak demand is the instantaneous real-time measurement. And so this study you will see focuses mainly on the peak demand and the capacity and how it changes under various temperatures. So this slide just shows some actual consumption information for the Kelowna area from 2020. Um, we've done the conversions to convert uh, either the gas or to the to convert gas to the equivalent electric um, measurement. So I won't, I won't go through all numbers, but just one thing I'll note is that you'll see the you'll see the number of customers, 44,000 for the gas side. So there's only two thirds of number of customers for gas compared to electric. And at the very bottom for the annual energy delivers close to an equivalent amount of energy in the year. But for the peak megawatt demand, the actual demand is already two to three times more. So what this case study does too is, is not only show the peak demand, but then start to focusing on the infrastructure required to meet it. Um, and as I mentioned, BC being winter peaking, it does on the electric side peak in the summer as well, but in the winter, about five to six p.m. is is when you start to see the peak demand from from the electric side, and so it becomes a bit more of a challenging discussion in in lieu of decarbonization, just from a, a BC context with having to focus on on so much of the peak demand being being met by the gas side, which we'll we'll show in a little bit as well. Um, so now I'll. With that context, I'll start to walk you through the model that was used in the study to, to show how the energy was converted from gas equivalent to electric. That is the Kelowna electrification model. So just starting with the scatter plot, um, I'll just orient everyone here. So at the bottom is the average daily temperature throughout the whole day, with colder temperatures on the left side of the bottom axis and warmer on the right. And then the peak, equivalent peak demand for megawatts, so the gas converted over, is shown going increasing upwards. So this model starts with the gas load. And as you can see, the gas load is not very impacted when the weather is greater than 15 degrees Celsius, because most of the gas load in Kelowna and throughout the province is used for heating, space heating, or water heating as well. And so when it gets colder than 15 degrees Celsius, then the space heating starts to take over. And over time, these dots can change kind of due to two things. They could, they could shift up as there's more customers. So if the amount of customers grow in a city, then at the equivalent temperature in the past, more demand will occur and the dots would shift upwards or they'd shift downwards if there's uh, better efficiencies, more demand side management, better building envelopes that would result in a less amount of gas demand served at the same temperature. So we take the scatter plot for the for three year average of loads from 2018 to 2020 and fits a regression out to the design temperature. So what this design temperature is, is it's minus 26 degrees Celsius and it's the temperature that the gas supply side plans to for the city of Kelowna and as well the electric system um, plans or infrastructure to. I think it's a one in 20 year return period that it will occur. And there's just a note here that in December of last year, Kelowna actually recorded a temperature that was slightly colder than this minus 26.2. And I think it has um, exceeded this average daily temperature in the past a few times in the past hundred years. And so with that, scatter plot of three years of load data, and then it's added the regression line to, to extend out to the design temperature at minus 26 on the left. And then when that's done, the electric equivalent demand is added in. And you really see the difference in, in how the electric load reacts under various temperatures compared to the gas. So as you can see here on the right, the, the number one on the very right, it has the two peaks in the summer. It does peak 
uh, due to a lot of cooling. But then on colder days, if you look at the left side and the difference in how high the yellow dots are for gas over electric, you'll note that most of the energy comes from natural gas. As soon as temperatures start to get below 10 degrees or zero degrees Celsius, then the space heating really takes over and you see the, the high trajectory of, of the line in orange, or sorry, in yellow, um, illustrating just how much demand starts to change over the cold temperatures. Whereas the blue line on the left side isn't quite as steep, meaning it doesn't quite change as, as drastically as the temperatures change. So then for this analysis, um, before starting to see what would happen if we were to convert gas demand over to electricity, I just want to explain heat pumps um, because they're, they're critical to this analysis and the conversion. So in order to model what heat pumps uh, would do if the gas demand was converted over, we used data from an actual field study, um, which was prepared for Fortis BC by RDH. And I forget the number, but I believe it monitored about 30 to 50 actual heat pumps within the province of BC and showed um, how they performed under colder temperatures. So compared to a lot of the other load that is implicit in the electric or gas demand, heating demand changes under temperatures and heat pumps are more efficient in warmer temperature. So in other words, as it gets colder, the heat pumps don't provide the same level of efficiency since they are, are affected by the ambient air temperature. And none of the currently installed heat pumps in the study operate at the 20, minus 26 degree design temperature. By, by operate, I suppose I mean they don't provide any efficiency gain versus what the equivalent electric efficiency would be served by the, the resistive auxiliary mode on the heat pumps or by baseboard space heating. So in other words, up to minus 18 degrees Celsius based on the, the field study for the actual heat pumps, they provide an efficiency gain over the equivalent gas or electric space heating technology. But then after that temperature, they don't provide any, any additional efficiency gains over the electric. Um, but we note in the study too that uh, we did we didn't provide it in the study, but we did some sensitivities afterwards showing that future heat pumps will likely be better and have um, greater efficiencies at colder temperatures. So this was just based on, on the field study what was there. And so this model was an interactive software application developed internally by Fortis BC. Um, so I explained the heat pumps, but some of the other things I'll just give you some context for first before I show the graphs is that each, each of these graphs are forecast demand in 2040. So it takes the three-year actual load that I just explained and grows it out at the expected or forecast growth rates, both on the gas and electric side. Then electric vehicles are, are added in as well for what the electric vehicle peak demand would be. The demand changes under temperature, which we'll see throughout the whole graph. Um, and then there is also some DSM savings applied on the peak. But traditionally, DSM savings on the electric side are, are far more important on the energy side. And the DSM savings after, after being applied here on the electric side, I think only save a couple megawatts in insignificant amount. And then I'll just walk you through the slides here showing different 25% increments of electrification. But before I do that, I'll start to the base case. So this is what demand would be in 2040, the peak demand shown at the very left of the graph, both the electric and gas sides, if there was no additional incremental electrification of the gas demand as shown in the graph. So you'll see if essentially if business as usual or if things continue as normal, then the electric load in 2040 would be 472 megawatts, whereas the gas demand at the peak temperature would be 3.9 TJs or nearly 1100 megawatts equivalent. And so as we walk through this, 
this slide I think shows more of a, a balanced energy system where both the electric and gas side are being used to serve the load throughout the year at all temperatures. Then as we start to shift, then everything shifts a bit more to the electric side. So it just has that baseline there, 472, what the demand would be if there was no electrification. And under 25%, then you'll see the electric peak load grow to 711. Um, there's a significant number, which I'll, I'll speak to a bit later, um, but just note that even under 25%, it increases to about 700. And as we go further, more and more of these gas load under all temperatures in, in yellow is converted over to the blue dots. And so under 50% electrification of all the gas demand, and I, I should note at this point too, that uh, the gas demand here is primarily residential and commercial. I think the amount of industrial load is like one or 2%. It's very insignificant because a lot of the other industrial load just for simplification it is, is ignored out of this analysis. So it is focused mainly on residential and commercial heating demand. Then as we shift over to 75%, and then lastly to 100%, it converts all the gas load through all temperatures over to electric. And you'll see here that there's a quite a steep drop off in this graph too from the regression line. And that's due to the efficiency that's provided by heat pumps. So as I noted earlier, they provide a heat, a heating efficiency gain um, at all these temperatures up to minus 18, but then after that point, the heating efficiency gain is lost. So they're not, they're not efficient enough to provide greater performances at the peak demand. And in the case of these graphs, if they were to be in like in, in the future, if we can perform at colder temperatures. In order to impact all the load, all of the customers would have to install a cold enough climate heat pump that would impact it. So obviously there'd probably be a, a mix of proportion that wouldn't it, when it perfectly drop that 1429 down. Oh, sorry. So this slide just summarizes the results from the model. Um, and I, I noted that 711 because currently our ultimate capacity that the Kelowna area electric system can serve is about 550 megawatts. That's the capacity of the transmission and distribution infrastructure in Kelowna. And so it forecasts it out to 2040, but currently in December 2022, the peak demand in the Kelowna area was only about 370. So it's 370 today and it would grow into the future, but without electrification, it's not forecast to grow higher than that 550. So in other words, in our, in our long-term electric resource plan, which I mentioned earlier, uh, we don't expect to meet that, reach that 550 limit uh, for many years past the 20 year planning horizon. But if a large shift of gas consumption over to the electric system occurs, or a fuel switching occurs, then we're in somewhat uncharted territory. And if you look at this graph or this table too, it just shows that that 550 occurs under a lot of the scenarios under a lot of temperatures too. So it's not, it's not just the minus 26 at 100% electrification where it is that high. So this slide just shows um, some of the context for, for what has occurred to get the Kelowna electric system where it is today. Um, so these are some of the major transmission projects we've constructed over the years. So as, as I mentioned earlier, Kelowna is supplied by three um, 230 kilovolt lines. But then once we exceed 550 megawatts, then those existing lines and the substations that that they supply will no longer be sufficient to get power into the region. And you see the, the dollar values on this slide too of, of the investments that have occurred over time to get the area to where it is today for its infrastructure. But then after that 550 threshold, then we start to build some very significant and costly new infrastructure. 
a potentially even new 500 kilovolt transmission lines like the ones shown on the right. So here's some of the listed projects that could be expected um, to serve those incremental peak demand. So new power lines and substations within the city will be required. Um, and to meet that demand, we'll also require new generation resource that's firm and dependable. So not um, located right in the Kelowna area somewhere, or if not, then we'd have to build these new 500 kV transmission lines from BC Hydro system into the area. And so that first Ashen Creek to Vasto Lake transmission line occurs at that 550 megawatt level. That was the one I about. But the second one, you would need another transmission line after the peak demand reaches 950. So either of these options, whether it's building the infrastructure or um, building enough resources within the Kelowna, enough generation resources within the Kelowna region would have some significant impacts, either through the, the costs of the infrastructure that will put pressure on our rates paid by electric customers, but then the construction of the new power lines, new substations or, or generation facilities will also impact the environment, the public and indigenous groups. So just looking at the very bottom line of this table, the costs of the system reinforcement total would start at about 1 billion and go up to there to about 1.9. Um, and we'll show, we'll show this in summary on the next slide as well. But just in context, um, the entire Fortis BC rate base, so that's the, that's the entire value of property of, of, or infrastructure across the entire Fortis BC electric service territory. So not just the city of Kelowna is about 1.5 billion. So we're talking about a doubling or more of the investment of electric infrastructure to meet this kind of peak demand. And that's just for the city of Kelowna. So this case study is really used to, to show um, what would happen within Kelowna, but perhaps something similar would happen throughout elsewhere in our system in the, or in the province if there is such significant levels of electrification and, and fuel switching over to increase the electric peak demand that much. So this slide just, just summarizes it. Um, and you'll see here that it adds, it adds in the land costs as well. So the cost of um, procuring the land for those infrastructure projects could be nearly as significant as the um, cost of the infrastructure themselves. And then also the execu executability of the, of the infrastructure is uh, an unanswered question as well, just with all, all those challenges such as the regulatory, indigenous and stakeholder engagement and everything in order to in order to do this if it were to occur in, in that 20 year time period. Um, and so what this case study is really important for I think as well is it just highlights some of the challenges in our in a small area um, and starts to starts to provide a, a case study or example of, of what could occur. Um, with some further analysis required to, to look at it for the entire Forest BC shared service territory. And so that's, that's work that we're still continuing on going forward to kind of provide some, some unique insights into electrification that the Utilities Commission and others may not have considered and, and just look at it in a more detailed and meaning way than um, simply rolling up the demand into an annual number and not focusing quite as much on, on the peak demand under various temperatures. And, how heat pumps could be used to meet those demand or, or other resources and, and the infrastructure that would be required as a result of it. Um, so I'll, I'll go to this slide and I'll answer a question that occurred earlier. So uh, this is just a, a hypothetical scenario to try and get down to the various load levels. So you see here in the dotted lines, I, I put in the, the threshold for the winter for those two large transmission lines. The first one I believe cost 500 million and the second about 450. So those are the, the big projects. Um, and it, walking from the very left here, here's the 1429. So this is what would occur if there was no, no mitigation or no efforts, which of course we would deploy various ways to try and reduce the impact um, of the peak demand on the infrastructure. 
So in orange, um, not focusing as much on the numbers, but more on the size of the of the colors here. This this would what what the peak demand would do if there was local generation um, in our long term electric resource plan. Our preferred portfolio of resources was accepted with two gas turbines and a utility scale battery. Gas turbines could be powered by renewable gas or in the future hydrogen, and that could reduce if it was located in the Kelowna area, reduce the need for transmission into the region. And then here's the EV shifting. So that demand is presented pre prior to EV shifting, and it included 75 megawatts of electric vehicle demand on, on the peak hour within the city of Kelowna. I believe the entire FBC service territory is forecasted to have 150 megawatts, of electric vehicles by 2040. So that's 70, that 75 megawatts is what would be attributable to the city of Kelowna. And in our long-term electric resource plan, we propose that we could shift about 50% of this, of this EV load away from the peak hour, assuming that customers would, would adopt a, a solution to, to shift their demand to overnight. And that could save 37 and a half, half of 50%. And then in the yellow here is a hypothetical number, but if there is additional residential and commercial demand response, where there were programs um, for customers to shift their demand besides EV vehicles away from the peak hour. But then what I'll focus on is that 571. So even with those three measures kind of, kind of put in first, there's still a large significant amount of of mitigation or, or other resources that are required to, to actually try and bring this level down to the 550 and not result in the costly tipping point of infrastructure. So here's my last slide, just kind of wrapping it up. Um, this is for the optimal route to decarbonization. So the most optimal route here, I think would be to maximize for decarbonization would be to maximize the conversion of passenger vehicles to EVs, but ensuring that if possible, that demand is mitigated away from the peak hour. I, I think there will be some conversion of gas to electric thermal heating load, but as we saw in the graphs, a minimal conversion such as 25% or, or I don't know what percent, but not 100% would, would be able to and not result in that significant upgrades at, at, a, at 100 percent within 20 years. It's it's just too much to to tip past the cost of the infrastructure that's required. But then as well, um, in the future we want to determine what our our hybrid implementation strategy would be. So, what what hybrids are essentially is sometimes are called dual fuel systems, and that would be customers using their gas their existing gas furnace during the coldest temperatures using a heat pump during warmer temperatures. So that can provide significant decarbonization here if customers were to adopt a heat pump, but still rely on their gas furnace to meet the peak demand. So that would avoid a lot of the, the peak demand impacts on the electric system under a lot of electrification. And then just in general, um, I think with, with all of these opportunities, um, we need to consider what is what is the safest, most reliable, most resilient, and most cost-effective way to reduce the GHG emissions, and and that is our our diversified pathway, our clean growth pathway that both John and I alluded to earlier, is to try and use both the electric and gas systems together. Because shifting over to to 100% electrification, solely electrification, just as shown in the study, has construction of lots of electric infrastructure. So kind of deferring or avoiding that where possible through a diversified portfolio of solutions, which would include um, using the gas infrastructure as well and having increased deliveries of renewable gas. So not even just hybrids, but having customers use renewable gas for their for their gas heating in Kelowna would defer, would, would avoid the ability of it needing to be met by a hybrid solution as well, or, or being switched over. So 
before I pass it over to John here, I'll just pause in case there's any other questions uh, come through or that I missed. Oh, John, I think your uh, mic is muted there. Having trouble hearing you. Got his video, but no mic. There he is. We can do some lip reading. <laughs> oh, unfortunately, I think the mic, maybe you want to take it, Jesse, while he... Uh... Yeah, you might have to go off uh, video, John, just try the mic. Um, did you see any other questions come through before we switch yeah. back? Let's do this. Uh, has Fortis BC considered selling heat cooling as a service rather than just gas? With extensive knowledge of pipes in the ground, there could be a great opportunity to move to low carbon district energy communities. We get to see these systems powered by heat pumps that are much more efficient than conventional gas equipment and gas absorption HPs. That's a mouthful, but... Yeah, and unfortunately, I don't have the perfect answer or experience for that, but I, I believe um, like our our division, one of our divisions of Fortis does offer those solutions. So mm -hmm. for, sh for sure, having those district uh, energy utility systems could could help meet a portion of this too. And I, I think that's a great question because it shows too, I, I discussed various ways here and I missed one too. It's, it's, it's really a lot of solutions that might have to occur rather to kind of, to kind of meet this and, and make a viable solution. Perfect. This one's from James. What heat pump COP did you assume in calculating winter electrical peak? Yeah, so the so in the RDH field study, there were three types of um, heat pumps that they they analyzed um, that were installed and the performances under them. So they were the highest performing, uh, medium performing, and lowest performing. And I believe the highest performing had a COP a coefficient of performance of three point five under zero degrees Celsius. So that 3.5 or 350% efficiency gain declines towards 1.0 when it reaches minus 18. So that is when the, the efficiency gain at 100% provides no, no gain over what uh, the equivalent electric would be. So I, I don't know the, the numbers under, all the curve, but it's it's 3.5 at zero declining to 1.0 at minus 18, but we use the highest performing ones that were shown in that study. Great. So it would, it would assume as well that every customer to 2040 would install the high ones, obviously. So there's, I think there's gonna be a mix of people installing various levels and then future ones as well as, as the performances get better. A lot of variables. Uh, another question from chat. Are we forecasting also the electric vehicle spike and its severe effect on the electric grid? Why don't we use gas fired absorption HVAC equipment avoiding losses like electrical fossil fuel generation, transmission, uh, lines, transformers, etc.? I think I answered that electric vehicle one with the, our, our plan to mitigate about 50% of, of the electric vehicle demand over the peak. Um, I'm not sure I understand the second part of that question, unfortunately. Sure. Um, the second part, I'll, I'll just read it again and then we can move on. But why don't we use gas fired absorption, HVAC equipment, avoiding losses, electrical and in brackets, electric fossil fuel generation, transmission lines, transformers, etc. I'll post it in chat too, in case uh, it's already in chat. You know, maybe we're missing a, it's a little context. So if they, you want to post that question again, I'll go to Chris, though. You reference uh, renewable gases related to biogas from what feedstock? How many biogas facilities are located within the region and are any fueled by agricultural manures? Um, in my, in a, are you hearing me now, Matt? Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah, you're okay. back, John, if you want right, to take that on. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And uh, apologize for technical issues there, as no usual, worries. right? Um, Definitely going to touch on that really right on, on the next slide as a kind of segue back to our conversation on uh, key characteristics of energy and a solution that Fortis BC has with renewable natural gas. So maybe I can unpack that as we move forward there. But uh, to the point, I, I, there was a question on the HVAC equipment gas absorption. Um, yeah, we certainly are investigating, you know, in terms of gas heat pump technology. Um, 
we've got, I think, 22 sites right now that are using gas absorption heat pump technology. We were in an event yesterday in Kelowna with uh, some of our uh, industry partners, like from Oprah and Bicot, that were, in, were uh, introducing this technology to mechanical, you know, the mechanical health trades, the, the mechanical engineering firms and contractors. Uh, and we see, you know, the, the heat pump technology as being absolutely uh, paramount in terms of our ability to deal with efficiency concerns and uh, climate concerns as well. Thank you. Um, I know we've got only 10 minutes left, but do you think it's we're going to go over time? I just want to give people a heads up. I think uh, I think we'll be fine here. Yeah, at least next to you, I'll probably be able to get through. Perfect. That time. Yeah. yeah. No, I'll, I'll let you do your thing, and we'll take any questions Great. if we have time at the end. Cheers. Excellent. Thank you. So we're going to kind of pick up, the, and again, thank you, Jesse, for that. Um, the kind of where we were, we were talking about key characteristics. We touched on the transportation aspect, and this is where we start talking about a solution that we have uh, with renewable natural gas, because um, we recognize that, great, we can transport energy, but if it's still fossil fuel energy, yeah, we're not really checking that box with clean. So, so we know we need to have a low carbon footprint. And this is where renewable gas really comes into the picture. So while well, some of you may know what renewable gas is, uh, for those that don't, it is a sustainable and a very low carbon methane that's produced by renewable sources. sources. I'm gonna to touch on a few here. So agricultural waste, farm waste is one source of it. Uh, we can also get this through organic waste, uh, through curbside collection, for example, of organics. There's also a uh, great opportunity with uh, wastewater treatment. Uh, we have a facility at Lulu Island in Richmond where we're, um, we're partnering with the municipality to capture uh, that wastewater. And finally, uh, with uh, landfills. Um, so there's a, a great, uh, you know, just a great example. Here's our partnership down in, uh, again, I'm on Vancouver Island with the Capital Regional District in Victoria, where at the Heartland Landfill, uh, we're partnering with them and then we're just building facilities right now. And we're going to capture enough low carbon gas out of that facility to heat about 3,000 homes a year. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and we're working with these partners throughout the province. So the more renewable gas that we can capture, um, the less conventional gas or fossil gas we need, that needs to be extracted. So it's a this question of displacing those molecules of traditional natural gas with renewable natural gas. And it should note that the province of BC recognizes through its clean BC roadmap uh, the very significant role that renewable gases and low carbon gases are going to play in our transition to a cleaner future. But importantly, this speaks to the characteristic of energy density. Uh, we can't lose density as we move forward, and as RNG is chemically the same composition as traditional natural gas, as such, there's really no loss in energy density. And it's also a drop in fuel. Uh, and by that, what I mean is, is there's no changes required from a customer's end. There's no upgrades, no changes to their appliances. Their burner tips will burn renewable natural gas just as they do tra traditional natural gas. So that transition or easy transition, we don't need to do upgrades to electrical panels or to, you know, to other, other uh, um, infrastructure to be able to, and appliances to be able to utilize renewable natural gas. But of course, we have to touch on affordability as well. Renewable gas comes at a cost, but is it affordable? So I'm going to share on the next slide here, uh, we're going to show an energy rate comparison here in British Columbia against uh, uh, BC Hydro, which is the majority of the province. Uh, they provide electricity for more of the province. So we're talking about this in cents per kilowatt hour. So you can see here, um, we have traditional natural gas coming in at about five cents uh, equivalent per kilowatt hour. And, uh, you know, we're, we're we are considering within there our carbon tax and our, our basic fees and all this. So it's kind of rolled in price for comparison sakes. Uh, renewable gas is coming in at about 7.9 cents. And you can see our electricity in here in BC and with BC Highway, the two tier system. So you're between a 19, 9 and 14 cents uh, per kilo, uh, kilowatt hour. So, and if you want to care, you know, if we're going to compare or use that to do a, let's say an annual comparison, you know, Primarily, if you're heating with electricity, you're going to use a lot of that second tier of hydro rates. So, so while we recognize that renewable gas is more expensive than traditional natural or than traditional natural gas, it's currently more affordable than what we're seeing for electric rates. And, so, and again, because it's a drop in fuel, our customers today they can uh, they can just use this by uh, simply uh, electing to uh, purchase renewable gas from Fortis BC. And I'll touch a little bit about that in the next few slides. How how people can access this. So first, we need to address um, 
question, and I, I think it kind of addresses a question that was raised about, hey, how much of this do you have? Uh, is it abundant? Um, so good news is, is that it's also, it can tick the box, and, and it does tick the box in terms of being abundant. So currently, uh, and I think we're good here if you flip the slide there, Jesse. Uh, currently, we've got about 18 uh, petajoules or 18 million petajoules of renewable gas that's under contract. That's both in BC and throughout North America. Uh, give you an idea how much energy that is, that'll it's enough to heat 320,000 homes. And another way to talk about this equivalency uh, is to compare it to the energy that's equivalent to the energy that site C dam in Northern BC is going to deliver once it's, once it's finished. So that's what we have currently approved by a regulator and under contract to be in our system within the next few years. We also conducted a, a study with the province of British Columbia on uh, the source, you know, we, you know to, that talked about the ability to have uh, the quantity of available low carbon renewable gases in British Columbia. And it concluded that there's uh, twice our, you know, twice our current throughput of renewable gas potential in BCLO. So we know there's a potential to supply for future needs for renewable gases. But of course we, have to address the, the clean box as well, the, the fifth element that we added to the key characteristics. And again, this is uh, great news where renewable gas has an extremely low emissions factor. You can see here that uh, our electricity in BC presently, uh, these things change over time. Yeah, I think electricity was 11, they're down to three and they're moving to lower that. It has uh, about three kilogram equivalent of CO2 per GDA. At, and at the burner tip, renewable gas has an emissions factor of only 0 0.29 kilograms of CO2 per uh, gigajoule. But if you look at the life cycle emissions, wheel to well, the, the emissions are actually negative. How do we get there is because renewable gas is displacing the need for conventional gas and its emissions. So for every molecule of RNG that we bring into this system, we displace the need to purchase a molecule of conventional natural gas. And as we're capturing this naturally occurring methane, say from a farm, that would otherwise naturally escape into the atmosphere, we can capture that, that, uh, we can capture that methane and utilize its thermal energy through the process of combustion, use it for the heat energy that we need, which converts it into CO2. And CO2 has a far lower uh, greenhouse gas warming potential. So whereas methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas with a 100-year global warming potential of 28 to 34 times that of CO2. Measuring that over a 20 year period of time, it actually is higher. It's about 84 to 86 times. So that's how we go. We say the burner tip is 0.29, but if you look at over the lifestyle, because we are capturing that methane that's again, naturally occurring, that would have a significant impact in the atmosphere and converting it to CO2, we reduce it, the, the effect multiple folds, which was why we reduce it. We can say that it has over its life cycle, a negative emissions factor. So I mentioned a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the renewable gas is a little bit more expensive than traditional natural gas, but they are currently cheaper than electric rates and, and uh, addressing that uh, need for affordability. And it's also taking the box off in terms of the, uh, it being clean. Okay, I'm going to just transition to the next slide here where we're going to talk about how we're going to deliver that. And this is unique. Uh, we, we feel this is unique in terms of uh, North America first, and potentially even a world first, is, which is the way that we're going to get this to our customers. Um, so we have a renewable gas application that's currently for British Columbia Utilities Commission. And which again, is offers North American possibly world first solution to meeting GHG targets for new customers connecting to our system. Presently, right now, we have a voluntary program. So our customers can connect to and use renewable natural gas. They can elect to have a portion of their, of their consumption from 5% up to 100% as renewable natural gas. And they pay a premium to do that. And that, they can do that simply by clicking, you know, like accessing their account online. They can just elect to pay that. And that affords us the ability with that increased revenue to go out to suppliers and purchase that renewable natural gas and displace the use of conventional natural gas. So 
uh, but what we need to address is municipal and provincial policies, because what's happening now is there is in British Columbia, there's something newly introduced called the zero carbon step code, for example. Right now, it's a voluntary pathway so municipalities can adopt, kind of goes from a moderate to a strong to a zero carbon level. So it measures uh, not the energy efficiency of the home, you might be re heard referenced as, uh, uh, as the energy step code, talk about building efficiency, this is related to uh, the the um, greenhouse gas intensity of the building. So municipalities can adopt this and this really restricts the ability for buildings to emit UHGI. So with traditional natural gas, it creates a problem for us. So our application to the commission will establish a rate, a new rate class, something as a utility we need. And with that, what we offer it then is for any new residential customer connecting to our system, we would allocate 100% renewable and very low carbon renewable natural gas Two, and it's attached not to the customer, it's actually attached to the premise and it's attached to the, to the building for the life of the building. And where that ticks a box for energy models and municipalities is, is that they can be assured that that building through its entire life cycle will have access to that renewable gas. And then they can model the home for energy efficiency, for greenhouse gas intensities. And because renewable gas has such a significantly low carbon intensity, it meets or exceeds any of the greenhouse gas intensity requirements that we see. So it, that's a, um, it's a very, uh, it, it's, it's something that's needed to address those measures. We're hopefully going to have an answer on this and later this year and be able to implement this next year. In the meantime, we do have a voluntary program as I mentioned for our customers. And throughout this process of introducing renewable natural gas in the system, we're not only going to offer 100% renewable gas to new customers. As we bring more renewable natural gas into our system and low carbon gases, we will slowly decarbonize our existing customers as well through time. So I've talked here today about uh, these characteristics about affordability, energy density, abundance, and transportability, and of course that fifth element about energy needing to be clean. All characteristics of energy that need to be recognized, and again, for mass adoption. You don't take all those boxes, you're not likely going to get that uptake. Diversity of energy is something that we take for granted, but it's also what makes our energy systems functions without thought. So we've got these, we've talked about options and choices. Jesse showed some examples of, you know, the implications of certain, you know, strategies to look for silver bullet approaches. And, you know, we, we talk about this and we talk to provincial government, we talk to municipal government, but we also talk very importantly to our customers, to our, uh, to our industry partners like yourselves to help inform them on these matters as well, uh, to raise awareness and consideration for these as we, as we move through this policy environment towards cleaner energy. So thank you very much for your time. I think we're holding on to time there. And yeah, is there any questions? Yeah, thank you so much. And my apologies for uh, typing madly in the back there. <laughs> Not a problem. Just handling an HRA uh, email. So I got a, a few more questions. It's uh, 205, so we'll go through these as quick as possible. Uh, increased investments in GSHPs in most parts of Canada. GSHPs can reduce the need to invest in expanded electricity infrastructure by a greater amount, resulting in overall cost reductions for Canadians, including in BC. I guess that's not so much a question as it is a comment, but do you want to speak to that? Yeah. Sure, the uh, sort of GAHP, like gap technology? Uh, GSHPs, and I'll put the... Oh, okay. Question. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Well, there we, we want to check our chat there uh yeah i'm not yes. sure sorry i'm not familiar with that that acronym um mm -hmm. on the i'm not sure if that's uh heat, certainly heat pump i'm gonna guess gas uh ground source heat pumps i'm oh, sorry ground source heat pumps. Mm. yeah yeah electric or geo exchange or we, like that. maybe whoever submitted that can add a little context yeah. uh yeah, while sure. we're waiting yeah um perhaps. And I don't know as much about ground source, but I thought that they were a lot more expensive than the like the various air sourced ones that we modeled here. So I think they no worries. They could yeah, be I, a portion, I, but I don't know, don't know how many customers in B, BC are actually installing ground source. I think one thing we can say about technologies is, and I mentioned in, in, the, in the presentation, is the concern over silver bullet approaches. There's no question that. I like, you know, we're not here to, you know, our message isn't that electrification is a bad idea. It's not at all. We've got a great, we've got a great resource in that clean energy and we need to utilize that to help meet our goals. And whether that's through traditional uh, heat pumps, electric only heat pumps, 
whether they're hybrid, as, as Jesse was talking about, or need to investigate into hybrid systems where gas is used for peak heating. And then, yeah, the source, whether it's air source or ground source, you know, these technologies, uh, what we know for sure and through what it is uh, time, shown through times is that there's always innovation on all fronts. It's not just innovation on the electric side and one sort of pathway. Everyone is innovating. Uh, you know, gas heat pumps are the technology is advancing rapidly. And, you know, we hope to be in a place in about five years when, when heat pumps are referenced, the question is, oh, do you mean gas or electric? You know, we need to, we need, the, we're going to need every tool on the table, whether it's our, you know, reports from uh, UBC or SFU to prominent universities in BC or even David Suzuki Society, like any pathway that shows electrification as the silver bullet approach is going to run into significant issues. We know that our own guidehouse report that steady diversified pathway versus an electrification pathway. Um, I think we're updating, but at that time, it'll, you know, it showed about a hundred billion dollar additional cost to go down an electrification pathway, uh, which again, just exemplifies why we need to look everywhere. And we also need to very importantly consider those, those key characteristics of that energy. Does it tick all those boxes? Thank you, John. I've got one last question for uh, you from James. What is the transmission loss assumed from electrical generation to use point? Uh, yeah, that's a tough question. It wasn't wasn't looked into it in the study since um, it was just a high level study, more focused on the cost than the losses. So I don't have a percentage value based on the result of the study. But um, I mentioned our follow ups of how we're going to look at it a bit more closely for the entire shared service territory, and that stretches far past Kelowna in, in the interior. So under that, then I think considerations will be given to, to what the losses would be, but I couldn't, I couldn't speak to the number or the percentage. Thank you. Uh, there was a question, I think this is for HREI, will the slide deck be shared? This video will be shared on HREI's YouTube page, so um, you can go there and rewatch as well. Uh, if you guys would like to share the slide point, we can, uh, the slide deck, we can talk about that after the call, but uh, I think we're good. Any parting words? For you guys? Thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for time. A, a lot of fantastic information. And I believe we're seeing you guys again in a couple months. Maybe. Maybe not. We'll see. We'll talk. Yeah. We'll talk behind the scenes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much, yeah, John, Jesse. Uh, great presentation. And um, is there any contact information or is there a slide you can put up with contact information if people want to reach out or any websites you want to throw up? Yeah, for sure. I think our last slide has some general info, but we can certainly pass it on. I'm, and maybe Jesse, yeah. I can talk about providing that PDF format with that information on it. We have I think be great. questions. Yeah, Excellent. yeah. You see some, see some on there. The you go. Last Just, slide uh, here, bottom right. Yeah. There you go. So you can reach out there. Thank you so much, guys. Happy Friday, and uh, all the best. Thank Thanks. you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.